Okay, we're starting. Okay. Page 11, Yud Aleph and Yud Aleph. It's Shabbos is the name of the chapter. First chapter in tractor Shabbos. So we ended off that uh, the shul should really be the tallest place right. in town. And other cities that did not have that eventually were destroyed. So the Gemara says, Right? We'll start from Vahani Mile. Are you not, are you not starting? Okay, wait a minute. Vahani Mile, Vatim, okay. Aval, okay, okay. Yeah, so Vahani Mile, Vatim, and this teaching applies to the roofs of houses. Aval, the Kishku Shevi, Bu, Eleison, Bo, but regarding the roof, of forts and towers, there is no problem. Amar Avashi, meaning there's no problem that they are taller than the shul. Amar Avashi, Anav de le Mosem Mechasa de Lechov. I made sure that Mosem Mechasa would not be destroyed, for I prevented the citizens from building their houses taller than the shul. Yomor says, but one second, Mosem Mechasa was destroyed. Rechov. It was not destroyed on account of the sin of making um, the houses taller than the shul. So it was destroyed for a different reason. Work under an Ishmaelite and not under a stranger. What's the difference between an Ishmaelite and a stranger? So number, number five, Edomite, a Roman. It is preferable to be a personal servant of an Ishmaelite than of an Edomite, because the Edomite are more wicked. Chabor. Mm-hmm. Under a stranger and not under a Chabor. Mm-hmm. Who is Chabor? It says, number six, the Chabarians are exceptionally destructive and com and commandering, bossy. Yeah, I guess they were Persians. Also, he says they they reside near the Persians. Yeah. Barbarians are as as a people descendants from the Persians. Anyhow, so work tachas nochri, which is Edomite, and don't work under chabot. Work tachas. You can work under a chabor and not under a Torah scholar. What's wrong with a Torah scholar? So it says in number seven, one who disturbs a Torah scholar is punished. It is impossible to constantly treat a Torah scholar with all the respect that is allegedly due to him. Therefore, punishment is likely. That's the interpretation of the ritual. So that will actually, you'll be punished by not treating him properly if you'll be working with a Tamit Chach. Tachas Tamit Chach, but Tachas Tamit Chach, it's better to work under a Torah scholar, not under an orphan or a widow. Why? Because they're, they're easily moved to tears. That's Rashi's explanation. They can cry quickly, you can harm them, you can um, mistreat, mistreat them easily. And oh. Yeah, very sensitive people. Any sickness, and not a sickness of a stomach. Any pain, any pain, and not a pain in the heart. Any ache, and not an ache in the head. Any evil, and not an evil woman. When choosing a wife in number 12, one should pay more attention to her character than to, her, to other attributes, such as lineage and family. A woman of evil character can give her husband grief his whole life to the point where he despairs of any enjoyment. That's the interpretation of Me'iri. So therefore, he writes that any type any sickness is better than having a stomach ache. A sickness of the stomach. Any pain is better than having a pain in the heart. 
any ache is better than have it's better to have any ache than the ache in the head and it's better it's better to have any kind of negative thing and not evil woman why do you, uh, and what is evil woman yeah, I oh this. evil woman he said is someone that has a bad character right he said it's better not to look at the lineage and uh, the family then it's more important to look at the character than, than the family and, and lineage. That's what he's saying, he's just high Yeah. But, uh, why Some people focus too much on the lineage and the family right. and forget about I mean, the actual character traits of that people, specific person that you have to live with. You're not living with their family and right. their lineage, you're living with a person. So make sure that her character traits are... Right. Gentle. Yeah, people come up with very stupid things. No one is perfect, but to have a gentle character trait. Yes. Yeah. Why are you saying this now? Oh, because of what we said before about Rav uh, Mechasio. Rav Mechasio spoke about uh, it's better to be under Shmuel and not under right, Goy. Right, right, all these So he continued things. about pain. Okay, fine. Because we started off, once you say a teaching of a sage, sometimes they continue with this teaching. So the, the original teaching of Rav Abba was about a city that is higher than the shul, taller than the shul. Right? Yeah. We could have had him on the phone, and then they could put him on the loudspeaker, and he could... Yeah, so we continue with the teaching of Rav al uh, So the uh, Omar Rav al Omar Rav Chama Rav Omar Rav Chama Bargui Omar Rav Im Yukolam Dayo If all the seas were black uh, were black ink all the oceans would be black ink and the marshes, the small lakes, were quills. You have the, the quill to, to write. And the heavens were parchments. And all the people were scribes. All seifrim. They would not, they, meaning they would have unlimited amount of ink, unlimited amount of pens, unlimited amount of paper would not suffice and everyone would be writers. They would not suffice to record um, the depth of the mind of the government. What does it mean? If you look at 14, a, a, a king must be mindful of countless matters. Every day there are taxes to be collected conflicts to be resolved, judgments to be passed in each of the provinces of his realm. The Gemara is teaching in a poetic style that one should always pray for the well-being of the government and not suspect it of wrongdoing. Yeah. The workings of a government are so complex that its intent behind any particular operation cannot immediately be discerned. Therefore, if one sees the government engage in something that seems improper, you should give it the benefit <laughs> of the doubt. Man, it's for you, huh? Meiri. Chidush Yaron writes that the, that the particular lesson of this passage, practical lesson. practical lesson of this passage, is that one should avoid dealings with the government, as stated in Pirk Alves. Yeah. Svasama so suggests that the Gemara means that a king requires this degree of intelligence to run his country successfully, but as a mortal, he cannot possibly have it. Only God, the supreme king of kings, is capable of such a task. Yeah. Maiko, what is the verse that, teaching, that teaches this? That there's a lot behind, a, a lot of thoughts going behind the decisions of the government. The heavens for height 
the earth for depth, and the mind of kings are beyond investigations. A fast is effective in nullifying the portents, the portents of a bad dream. As fire is effective in consuming the toe of flax. Just as fire can consume flax, so too when it comes to uh, fasting, if someone had a negative dream. Right? Right. Omar of Chizda, of Chizda said, and the fast is most effective on that very day, the day of his dream. Such a fast may be observed even on the Shabbos, what we call Tanis Chalem. Yeshua, the son of Rav Idi, visited the house of Rav Ashi. So they prepared for him a third, a third born calf. Meaning a cow that had this third baby. I guess the third baby is the most uh, delicious. Amule. Eighteen. The meat of the, such a calf is superior. Yeah, the meat yeah. of such a calf, the third calf, is superior. Right. It says when the cow is still young, it is not sufficiently robust to produce that healthy calves. The first two calves that a cow bears are generally not as health, healthy as its uh, third one. Okay. Curious if this applies also to human beings. Uh, being the well, third... In your case, it didn't. <laughs> the third in the family. To the, those, your kids are great. You know, maybe the third one is superior. <laughs> well, let's see what Mendel does. <laughs> He's stepped up to the omelet right away. Yeah. It'd be great. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, anyhow, it says they told him to, to taste. They gave him such a good, um, such delicacies. Let me, let master master taste something. I'm I'm observing a fast. I'm fasting today. But does Master not agree with what Rav Yehuda said? Omar Rav Yehuda, leve odum tanisei. Person who has accepted the, to fast may borrow his fast. He may break his fast if needs if need arises. Uferea and repay his uh, obligation by fasting on a different day. So Omar Rav tanis chaloi. So he said to them, it's tanis chaloi. It's a fast occasioned by a frightening dream. Omar mechas Omar Rav. And he told them what we just learned before, that a fast is effective in nullifying the protents of a bad dream, like fire is effective in consuming a toe, the toe of flax. The most effective, and it's the most effective to fast on that very day. Even on Shabbos is is effective. Even on Shabbos you should do it. And if one started any of these activities, one does not have to interrupt it for the Mincha prayer. Right? We spoke about the Mishnah, different activities. One of them was uh, what the 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 belt uh, undoing your belt yeah the Babylonians used to eat release their belt they meet so if one started one one does not inter- have to interrupt is eating whatever he does for the Mishnah prayer for the Mincha prayer says one has to interrupt an activity for the recitation of the Shema one does not have to interrupt it for prayer. The Gemara asks why the Mishnah added at the end, but one does not have to interrupt it for prayer. Tana Leresha ain't of seeking. Because uh, the Tana already told us in the first part of the Mishnah, ain't of seeking. One does not have to interrupt it for the Mincha prayer. See for, see for us only the latter clause refer to those studying words of Torah. 
that is, he teaches that one, that the study of Torah is interrupted only for the Shema and not for prayer. The Tanya, it was taught in a Baizoch, Avedim Shoim of Oiskim Vatel. Scholars who are studying Torah of seeking Likhiyat Shema, they were, they would stop and say the Shema. Stop the learning and say the Shema. Pain of seeking list philo, but they did not interrupt the studies for prayer. The Gemara limits the scope of this ruling. When did we say that you should stop your that you don't stop your learning only for Shema? That's with Rabbi Rabbi Shimon Yochai and his colleagues. Shati Rosan Umanusan whose only occupation is the study of Torah. But people such as ourselves who interrupt their studies for work must interrupt their studies for, the, for both the recitation of the Shema and for prayer. Just one does not interrupt for prayers. So one does not interrupt for the recitation of the Shema. Now, even if, if even those whose sole occupation is Torah study must interrupt their study for the Shema, to whom this vice's ruling apply, it says in 28, right, based on our goyes of Elazar Moshe Horowitz, put in the back of the Vilna Shas. Uh-huh. So Gemara says, Kitani Aibibushan, the Baisa was taught concerning judges who were deliberating the extension of the year. Whether it's a lip year or not, when we were engaged in deliberating the extension of the year in Yavne. We would not stop neither for the recitation of the Shema nor for prayer. Start the new Mishnah. The following Mishnah cites several precautionary laws enacted to prevent inadvertent violation of the Shabbos. This is in the bottom of Yud Aleph Amud Aleph 11a3 in the Schattenstein. Taylor may not go out with his needle close to nightfall on Friday afternoon. Shema Yishkach lest he forget and then he would be carrying his needle on Shabbos. Neither may a scribe go out with his, his quill, he should go with a pencil, a pen, Shabbos. And one may not delouse his garments. So see what is delousing your garments. Vileiko, and one may not read from a text, Le'iraner, one should not read by the lamp of a light. Be'emesomu, in truth they said, Achazan roi chatinok haskerin, the sexton, the chazan, may look where the children are reading by lamplight. Aval hu lo'iko, but he may not read by lamplight. It says in uh, 36, the Mishnah refers to the sexton of the synagogue, whose duty it was to summon seven people to read from that week's Torah portion on Shabbos morning. If he did, if he did not know which portion was uh, supposed to be read that Shabbos, you could identify it by watching the school children study the week's portion in the synagogue on Friday night. Mishnah teaches that although he may not actually read the text by lamplight, he may glance into the children's scrolls to observe, to observe from where um, they are reading. <coughs> so <coughs> the Mishnah, <coughs> excuse me, Mishnah concludes with the uh, with a precautionary decree unrelated to the Shabbos. Kayoitzeboy, lo yoychala zav im hazavo. A zav may not eat together with a zav since it might lead to sin. A zav is a man who became Tomeh through a grow, 
gonorrhea. Gonorrheal STD. emission. STD. STD. Similar but not identical to a seminal emission. Yeah. A zava is a woman who experiences a flow between the usual time for her monthly period. A zava is a woman who experiences a flow between the usual time for her monthly period. The Mishnah's law also applies to a nida, a woman who experiences a flow during a monthly period. So uh, now the cohabitation with a zava or nida who has not purified herself by immersing in a mikveh is punishable by chorus. Rabbi is enacted safeguards to prevent such thing from happening between a husband and a wife during the time she is either Nida or Zava, such a, such a safeguard, one such safeguard was instituted for the time they eat together because sharing a meal can create an intimate at- atmosphere which may lead to intimate relations. They decreed that a husband and a wife may not eat together at the same table without a reminder, what we call today hacker such a separate tablecloth or setting between them an object not usually found on the table. Shulchan Aruch in 1953 discusses it at length. Anyhow, Tenanos of the Gemara says, Lo yamoid odom b'shusayochit ve'ishti b'shusorabi. Person may not stand in a private domain and drink in a public domain. Don't stand in private and drink in public. Or vice versa. Stand in public domain and bend forward and drink in a private domain. But if he brought his head and most of his body into the domain in which he is drinking, in, in which he, he is drinking, muta, it is permitted for him to drink, if this person is unlikely to forget and transfer the cup from one domain to another. So if a majority of your body, this also applies in the laws of sukkah, if the majority of the body in the sukkah or not, right. the majority of the body is in Shusa Rabim, your legs are all in Shusa Yochid, it's okay. That's what it seems like. So far, Roy Shuvarubu, Lamak Mishurait, and Muta. Page Yud Aleph on with Beis eleven B one Vechein Vegas and the same applies in the same in the case of wine press. What happened in the wine press? The Gemara will explain. Ibalu Kamalis my what is the law in regard to Kamalis? It's not a Shusayach. It's not a private domain. Not a public domain. It is permitted to stand in a Kamalis and drink in a private domain or a public domain, vice versa. Meaning leaning toward from Kamalis to public or private. I'm a by he he. It is the same. The retractive, uh, the restrictive law that applies to the biblical domains also applies to the rabbinic domain of communists. The law of communists is itself only a rabbinic decree. And are we to arise and, and legislate another rabbinic decree to protect the rabbinic decree? From where do I derive my ruling? The Ketani, I derive it from that which the Mishnah taught, Vechein Begas, and the same applies in the case of a wine press. Presumably, this means that one may not stand in a biblical domain, lean over a wine press. Biblical domain would mean private or public and lean over a wine press and drink wine from it from from it with a vessel my gas what is the status of a wine press what does it mean what is the status of a wine press a place where you make wine if wine press is considered private domain tanina we already learned this law in the preceding part of the Mishnah, which states that one may not stand in a public domain and drink from a private domain, meaning standing in a public domain and leaning toward a private domain. Already learned it. If you say that God, uh, a wine press, 
is Rosh Hashanah in his public domain. Tanin also, we already also learned that you should not be standing in public domain and drink from a private domain. You have already learned this law in the Mishnah, which states that one may not stand in a private domain and drink from a public domain. El alav, evidently, Carmelis. We have to say that a wine press <coughs> is Carmelis. Mishnah teaches that one may not stand in a biblical domain and drink from a Carmelis. Rava, who holds that um, this rabbinic decree does not apply to a Carmelis, interprets this clause differently. Rava Amar, Vechein Begas Le'inyan Maisa. The Mishnah clause, and the same applies in the case of a wine press, refers to the subject of Maisa, and is not related to the laws of Shabbos at all. Vechein Omar Rav Sheshes, and so said Rav Sheshes. The Mishnah's clause, speaking about the wine press, is, is really referring to the subject of Maisa. What it has to do with Maisa? That none, one may drink wine over the wine press. Whether it is diluted, diluted with water, or with cold water, Either it's diluted with hot water or diluted with cold water, he's exempt from tithing it. Divrei Rabbi Meir. These are the words of Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir holds that drinking over the wine press is a casual manner of drinking, and thus one may drink it, um, drink in that manner without tithing. Remember the law that a tithing you have to only tithe when you bring the produce to the house. When it comes to a wine press, you are allowed to drink because it's not yet in your house. You're allowed to drink there, according to Rabbi Meir, whether you diluted it with hot water or cold water. Rabbi Abelezer, the son of Rabbi Tzadok, obligates one to tithe wine that he had diluted, even if he drinks, uh, even if he drinks it over the wine press itself. The very fact that he diluted the wine makes it. A formal manner of drinking. When the sages say, Alachamin Chayov is obligated to tie the wine that is diluted with hot water. So, but he is exempt from tithing wine diluted with cold water because he could pour back whatever remains into the wine press. So if you dilute it with hot water, according to Chacham, you have to give tithing because you can't bring it back into the into the barrel, into the wine press. But if it's dilute with cold water, you don't have to tithe because you can put it back. So the Gemara above cited the dispute between Rava and Abai as to whether safeguards were established for rabbinic clause, which themselves serves only to safeguard against biblical transgressions. The Gemara attempts to derive a proof to one side from our Mishnah. Tanan. What did we learn in the Mishnah? A tailor may not go out with his needle on Friday afternoon close to nightfall. Why? Shema ishkach Lest he forget that he's carrying it and go out with it after nightfall. My love, the sechuva le'vevigdoi. Now, is the Mishnah not discussing a case where the needle is pinned to his garment? Transferring a needle to another domain in this unusual manner is prohibited only by rabbinic decree. Yet, in order to prevent violation of this rabbinic decree, the rabbi is prohibited going out with the needle before nightfall. This proves, as Abai asserts, that the rabbis do establish safeguards for their own laws, what we called before a gezeira to gezeira, decree upon, uh, on top of a decree. So the Gemara, if you disprove, no, the Mishnah does not refer to a case where the needle is pinned to his garment. Rather, it refers to a case, the Nokitle Biyode, where he's holding it in his hand, transferring a needle in this manner is a biblical transgression. The Mishnah, um, the Mishnah's prohibition is designed to safeguard a biblical, a biblical prohibition rather than a rabbinical one.
Tashma lo yitzah had b'machta tchula b'vigdoi. My love of Shabbos. Obviously, what what time the tailor should not go out with his needle pin to his garment? He's speaking about erev Shabbos, Friday afternoon. Why? Because he might transfer the needle after nightfall. And the Bible explicitly, explicitly refers to carrying a needle pinned to one's garment, which is only rabbinically prohibited. We see that the rabbis do establish safeguard for their own laws. The Gemara says, Loi. The Bible does not refer to the eve of the Shabbos. Kitanya, Ibe Shabbos, rather, when the Bible teaches that one may not go out with a needle pinned to his garment, it means on the Shabbos itself. It prohibits transferring a needle in such a manner on the Shabbos itself. Why? Lest one transfer it in his hand at that time, which is a biblical violation. The Gemara attempts another proof. The Tanya lo achad machta tchum vigdo. A tailor may not go out with his needle pinned to his garment. Be'erev Shabbos im, hach, im chashecha. On the eve of the, of the Shabbos, shortly before nightfall, the Bible explicitly refers to a needle pinned to his garment the transfer of which is only rabbinically prohibited. He's not holding it in his hand, it's pinned to his garment. And yet, it forbids this even before the Shabbos. We see that the, Shab- that the rabbis establish safeguards to their own laws. And that's really what we're trying to get to. That the rabbis are establishing safeguards to their own laws. Hamani, whose opinion is it? Rabbi Dama, woman, der said that a craftsman who carries his acuterments, his his tools, in the manner of his craft, is liable for committing a biblical transgression. Although this manner of carrying would be an unusual for other person, the Tanya, it was told about during the Shabbos, a tailor may not go out with his needle pinned to his garment. Will he not go with Kesom Shabosne? No, a carpenter with his ruler behind his ear. Will he serik with Mesicha Shabosne? No, a fueler or fowler. It's uh, those who used to comb a comb a wool, I believe. Mm-hmm. A fuller is a craftsman. With his cord. Comes, craftsman. Comes, a yeah. craftsman who combs cloth to fluff up its nap. In his trade, he employs a certain type of cord <laughs> to bind together the thistles with which he combs the cloth, as well as to tie down the ends of a cloth to the frame it is stretched upon when he beats the fabric to raise the nap. Mm. So he should not go out with the cord behind his ear. Nor a weaver with his stopper behind his ear. One who weaves. No, a dyer with a, his switch. Swatch. With his swatch piece of, uh, on his shoulder. Yeah, piece of garment. Nor a money changer with a dino behind his ear. Vim Yotso, and if one of them did go out in this manner into the public domain, Pato of Alosso, holding in 11b3. Pato of Alosso, he is not liable under biblical law, but is forbidden to do so under rabbinic law. Div Rabbi Meir, did it was Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda Emer, Uman Derechum Nusay Chai, a craftsman who carries his. Acuterments, his his uh, tools, in, or oh, his helpers, in the manner of his craft, is liable under biblical law. Ushar kol odom potu, but any other person who carries such items, in this manner, is not liable because it's not it's not the usual way how he carries it. The visor which prohibits a tailor to go out with his needle pinned to his garment shortly before the Shabbos can be interpreted. As following Rabbi Uda, who maintains that this is a biblical prohibited manner of carrying. According to this explanation, the Mishnah's law safeguard a biblical prohibition rather than a rabbinical one. Ton Ichado, Loetzazov, Bechisoi, Izav may not go out on the Shabbos with his pouch. 
Zav is one who experiences a gonorrheal, right? Gonorrheal mm-hmm. omission. Yeah. Similar, but not identical to a seminal omission. Um, he would wear a pouch around his organ to capture these discharges. For certain reasons, the Gemara will mention shortly. This pouch is not classified as an article of clothing, which one is allowed to wear in a public domain, because unlike clothing, its purpose is not to protect the body, rather to contain the emission. Mm. So, it's, so it says, So Zav may not go out with his pouch, like a diaper. He had his own diaper. How can he not? Let, how can he go out? He's going to make a mess. I, I right. It says that's what it says. The im yotzer potu. We should probably stay in his house. Tanya idoch lo yitzer. A zav may not go out on the Shabbos with his pouch. Im yotzer chav chatos. And if another version says that if he did go out, it's not potu. He has rather he has to he has to bring a korban chatos. He has to atone for the sin offering. The Gemara attempts to resolve this contradiction. Does he spot to completely, or he has to bring Korban Chattis? One is the opinion of Rabbi Meir, which rules that Azov is not biblically liable for going out with his pouch. Follows Rabbi Meir, who maintains if one carries something in a manner usual for him, but not for general public, but not for the general public, he is not biblically liable. Mm-hmm. Rabbi Yudah, and the second writer which rules the Zav is liable for Korban Chattos follows Rabbi Yudah, maintains that if one carries something even in a manner that is usual only for him is biblically liable Rabbi Meir say that you heard Rabbi Meir rule that the person is not liable only in a case where he carries something in a manner that is not that is unusual even for himself but in a case where he carries something in a manner that is usual for him, for example, is that wearing a pouch? Me Shomatle, have you heard Rabbi May rule that he is not liable? Rabbi May would agree that Azav is liable for wearing this pouch because that is his way of carrying it. Then Abaya now proves that this point for if you do not say this and amateur headyate who carved out a cove sized hole in a law in a log on the Shabbos. He made a hole in a piece of wood on Shabbos. But he's an amateur. He's not uh, he would not be liable according to Abime, although an amateur does not perform such work. In the standard way, Rabbi Meir surely maintains that he is liable for violating the Shabbos. Rabbi Meir evidently agrees that if a person does something in a way that is normal for him, although it is not the standard way, he is liable. Having rejected the previous approach, the Gemara suggests another solution of the con- contradiction between the Baisa, the Baisas about a Zav's pouch. <laughs> Here in the Baisa, which rules that Azav is liable for going out with his pouch. The reference is to Azav who experienced two emissions. Since he must wear a pouch at this time to detect a possible third discharge. It is considered normal for him to wear the pouch and hence he is biblically liable for doing so. Khan Bezav Baal Sholosh Here in the Baisa, which rules that the Zav is not liable, the reference is to a Zav who has already experienced three emissions. Since no longer, he no longer needs the pouch, it is unusual for him to wear it, and hence he is not liable for doing so. Maishna Zav Vashir is the Chad in Bala Vidika. Zav Vashir is not in Bala Lesfir. So, what's the difference between a Zav who experienced two emissions that renders him liable for wearing the pouch? Um, the reason is that he needs he needs it for checking whether a third discharge occurred. Zav bal sholish nami mi sphere, but a zav who has experienced three emissions should also be liable. Why? Because he needs the pouch for counting his seven clean days. I don't know. It says thirty two. Whether a zav experiences two or three emissions or more, it does not become toy until he counts seven clean days. 
bless you, free of any emissions, and then immerses himself the seven clean days, the seven clean days must be co uh, consecutive. That is, if the Zav has an emission any day during that period, he must begin the count all over again. Right, we know that. Consequently, even a Zav who has experienced three emissions has a reason to wear a pouch. He needs it to detect any emission that would interrupt the seven-day period. Otherwise, how, how would he know if he's clean for seven days? He has to right. wear the pouch and then he can check himself. Indeed, the Baisa's ruling that a Zav is not liable for wearing his pouch is relevant only in the case of a Zav who wore the pouch on the very day that he experienced the third discharge. Since his count of seven clean, seven clean days has not yet begun, he does not need the pouch. The Baisa therefore rules that such a Zav who wears a pouch is not liable. But he needs a pouch, like you said, so that his clothes do not become soiled. It shouldn't make a mess. Even on the day of his third discharge, the Zav needs the pouch to protect his clothing. And thus he should be liable for wearing it outside. He, the Tana of the Baisa, and this is this Tana who says, Kol Anything done to have something from any anything done to save something from becoming soiled, becoming dirty, is not legally significant. So then he's potter. Right. That none we learned in a Mishnah, if one turned over a plate on top of a wall while it was raining, and the rainwater then dripped from the plate onto some produce. The law is as follows. If he put the plate on the wall so that the plate should be rinsed by the falling water, this is a, a um, this case is subject to the scriptural rule. If water is placed, that is, the produce is rendered susceptible to tumor contamination. Right. Because the water touch it, so it's it's right. it's susceptible to tumor contaminations. Right. In Bishvil, if on the other hand, the the owner placed the plate on the wall in order to protect the wall from damage from the rain, on the scriptural term of if water is placed does not apply to this produce. The Tana of this Mishnah apparently maintains that an act done solely to protect something from damage is not significant. This view can be used to explain the bias cited above, which rules that a Zav is not liable for going out with, with, with his pouch, since the Zav uses the pouch only to protect his clothing. It's like the, the ball, the plate that is there to protect the wall, is not there to protect the pouch. His wearing of the pouch is not reckoned a significant act for which one is liable on Shabbos. We'll continue, but willing, tomorrow. So you don't have.